Well, good morning, everybody, for wherever you are around the world. We're happy to have you with us. I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. We're live here with a full shrine at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy for the critically important devotion of First Saturdays. One that I have said from the beginning is along with Divine Mercy, uh, along with the Sacred Heart, along with the Immaculate Heart, and precious blood. The Immaculate Heart is the first Saturday devotion. So today, stay with us because we're going to lead you to everything you need to know. And we're going to begin today, as Brother Mark showed on the slide, with two important, and if we could silence our cell phones, please. Thank you. We're going to start with two important Marian apparitions, one you've never heard of and one everybody's heard of. So let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask to give you all glory and praise, and most of all, through the honor of your gift of Mother Mary. And let us listen to the message of heaven as you have given to us through her. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you again, everybody, for being with us. And it's, I'm excited because um, I've been able to get a little bit of help uh, with my mom through for some family members. This is going to allow me to return now, not just on first Saturdays, but now every Saturday, I will be back doing a brand new talk uh, for explaining the faith. So every Saturday at 11, please join us live. The only Saturday I know I won't be here is June 25th, so uh, three Saturdays from now. But other than that, please join us. We're going to be doing great topics like, is the Pope infallible, Vatican II, Freemasonry, um, what about all the New Age stuff, yoga, Reiki, is that stuff okay? Is it not okay? So please join us in the weeks ahead, Theology of the Body. One that's a little embarrassing, but it's very important to talk to, is the teach church's teaching on sexuality. What is allowed, what is not, even within marriage. People seem to think in marriage anything goes. It's actually not true. So these are all great topics that we're going to be talking to you about in the next upcoming weeks. Okay. Now, one of the questions we always get is, what about non-Catholics? Does Mary appear to non-Catholics? And what is the message if she does? Okay. That's why I picked this first apparition. This first apparition that we're going to talk about is very interesting. Now, 250 years before Lourdes or Fatima, Our Lady appeared in a little village, Shiluva, in Lithuania. Let's take a look at our map if you're following us on your cell phones. This is the little red dot in northern Europe kind of close to Russia, you can see Belarus, Poland. This is the home of St. Faustina. There's a connection here with our beloved St. Faustina. She lived there for a while. Now, why do I pick this? Because in 1251, Lithuania was the last European nation to accept Christianity. The last one. They all else did. Now we're losing our roots. People don't seem to realize every country in Europe was Christian. And Lithuania was the last one. And they became what they called the youngest daughter of the church. Now, who's the first daughter of the church? France. And that's going to be our second apparition today. So now, there was time when Lithuania, though, came close to losing her Catholic faith altogether. And this is a story. It's amazing. But something happened in 1608, this little village, a Shiluva, which turned back the tide of the Reformation. Okay, so picture this. Reformation happened when? 15, early 1500s. All of a sudden now, it's threatening Catholicism everywhere, and especially Lithuania, but then something happened in 1608 that helped dress this. Now, the story of Our Lady here actually goes back to 1457, all right, over 500 years ago. What happened? All right, 
there was a diplomat. Yes, they had politicians even then that built the first church in the area and gave the land to the Catholic Church. Now, this is important. Now, on a trip to Rome, he obtained a magnificent painting. Nobody knows where it came from. Of Mary holding the child Jesus. Now, that's important. Remember this, because it's going to come back in this story and it's going to blow you away. So this diplomat goes to Rome, gets a painting of Mary holding the child Jesus. He brought the painting back to Lithuania and put it in the church. All right? For several generations, these Lithuanians worshiped God and honored Mary there. Now, a hundred years later, 1532, the governor became a Calvinist. Okay? Became Protestant as did many nobility and intellectuals of the day. Now, the Catholics there in Shiluva, they were helpless. They were being run out. Kind of sound like today, the Middle East and different places. And the property owned by the church was confiscated, turned over to the Calvinists. We never hear about this in history. All we ever hear about is the horrible things the Catholics did, which are most of the time exaggerated, but we never hear about this. They took everything from the Catholics. Now, when the parish priest in Shiluva saw this, he built an ironclad box, all right? And he wrapped up the painting that he brought from Rome with, along with liturgical vestments and documents showing they were given that land. It proved that the land had been given to the church, and he put them all in this box. Okay. He buried it next to this giant rock. Now, it was of the Holy Spirit. It was, because a short time later, they seized the church, the authorities. This is happening today. We're living everything all over again. So it seemed it was the end of the Catholic faith. 80 years go by. Basically, all the Catholics had died. Only a few were left. I also think we're going to be heading down that road too. Catholics are dying out or they converted or just dropped the faith. It was dying. Suddenly, God miraculously intervened. What did he do? As many times, he sends his mother the apparition of Mary. This apparition was proven as an actual event by history and authenticated as being church approved by papal decree by Pius VI and then later in uh, the next century. But anyway, the most remarkable feature is that this all happened to non-Catholics. So does Mary approve uh, appear to non-Catholics? Listen, in this summer day in 1608, a number of children were tending their sheep in the field. This was outside of the village of Shiluva in Lithuania. They were playing near a large rock. Take a guess what large rock. Suddenly, each of the children became transfixed, staring in the direction of the rock. This is documented. Now... They remained in silence. They couldn't even speak. But what you could hear was a sobbing, loud noise. All right. Then the children beheld a beautiful woman standing on the rock holding a baby in her arms. Now she was weeping, but she did not speak. And she looked at them sadly. Sadly, and so many tears were pouring down her eyes that they fell onto this rock. Now, this is important. The woman they described was dressed in a beautiful robe unlike anything they had ever seen, and some light surrounded her. Now, the children were so startled that they couldn't speak. They just stood there and they stared. Now, how often do you find that with kids, right? Kids are never speechless. So this had to be something miraculous. Now, amazement, though, turned to fright 
when this woman and her baby disappeared. Okay, picture this scene now. And they all the children then began to talk. Okay, so here they are. They're transfixed. They can't speak. They're dumbfounded. They see a woman. She disappears. Now they start talking. They're full of joy. And one of the boys ran to the village and told the Calvinist pastor. Okay, now he was told to stop making up such a tale by this Protestant pastor. Now, news spread quickly the next day, and the townspeople came to this rock. Some were scoffing, but others were impressed because these children were crying, crying with joy, telling the story. Now, here's what's interesting. Whether they talked to the children separately or together, their story was exactly the same. That doesn't happen with kids, right? Their stories change all the time. When I tried to explain what happened to the cookies, my story to my mom changed five times. <laughs> and then my story was different from my sister's story, okay? Now, the Calvinist pastor became alarmed. He told his people, stop being so gullible. Right? Stop being so gullible. And he was worried about the superstition. Now, here's what's interesting, is he warned them that this was the work of Satan. How many times have you heard that? How many times have we heard from non-Catholics that any word uttered from the mouth of Mary is from Satan? It's unbelievable. He wants to lead you away, they say to us. They tell us, God bless you, Rose. <laughs> You're free to come back. God bless you. God bless you. So Satan's trying to lead you away. No, no. Then all of a sudden, this Calvinist pastor hears sobbing. And all eyes, now there's adults there, turn to the rock, and there standing in the mist, now visible to the adults, was a weeping lady with baby in her arms. The people stood in amazement, and now the pastor, this Calvinist, was in amazement. Couldn't do anything but stare, just like with the kids. So the pastor acknowledged it finally, and he was able to speak, and he said, who are you? Why are you weeping? So she identifies herself as Mary. And he says, why are you weeping? And she says, there was a time when my beloved son was worshipped by my people on this very spot. Now it has been taken. Now they have given this sacred soil over to the plowman and the tiller and for animals for grazing and the land has been taken from our church. Now, without another word, she vanished. Now, the fact that the mother of God, Mary, appeared to chide them for their neglect of not being a Catholic church anymore spread among the people. Basically, Mary was telling them, correcting them. Now, most of them listened and began to return to the Catholic faith. They said, this has to be a message from God. So deep was this, that just a few years later, more than 11,000 people showed up for one mass there. 11,000, you're talking a little medieval village in the middle of the mountains of Lithuania or the, the rural area of Lithuania. My goodness. The only place we can get 11,000 people to in the United States, we got 300 million people, is a ball game. You know? Um, so anyway, a miracle then was basically this. That there had been no church, no priest, and no mass for almost 80 years. Yet now the people were coming back. So the bishop appointed a team to investigate this. And in many apparitions, they looked for commonalities. And guess what? most apparitions have a picture or a statue associated with the event. But there was no, there were, Mary didn't leave a statue. You know how the other ones I told you about over the past few months, Mary would leave a statue or she would emblaze a, a picture on a tree. Well, the problem was we didn't have a picture here. 
Oh, but wait. A blind man who was over 100 years old heard about this. He lived nearby, and he recalled over 80 years earlier when he was a boy, he helped Father Holubka bury a chest with church treasures beside a big rock. You can see what's coming here. The villagers led him into the field to see if anything would happen, where the apparitions happened, to see if he could locate this buried treasure chest. No sooner did he get there, his sight was restored. He suddenly could see. Falling to his knees, he pointed to the exact spot where the chest was buried. Now, let's take a look at our next slide, if you're following us. That chest was dug out of the ground, and inside it, perfectly preserved, was a painting of Mary holding her child. This was the vision the children saw, and it was buried in an image for 80 years. I mean, this is incredible. No other faith has this kind of rich history but our Catholic faith. It's all dismissed as pagan and, and idolatry. Images are not idolatry. If you're interested, I have talks all over YouTube about Deuteronomy does not forbid images. Graven images are for the purpose of worship. That's what's forbidden. Otherwise, Jesus, uh, God commanded uh, uh, cherubim to be carved on the Ark of the Covenant. He, he commanded uh, Moses to carve a bronze a serpent and put it on a pole. Images are not forbidden. It's worshiping the images that's forbidden. Nobody worshiped this image of Mary. But what's miraculous is it was what the children saw. So they pull this box, and this painting was inside, along with the same vestments and the deed that proved the church was given, or the land was given to the Catholic church. I mean, you can't write this. So let's look at our next slide. The painting was enshrined permanently in the basilica. And I had the pleasure of being there. This is incredible. The painting was put in there and they venerated to this day this image, Our Lady of Sri Luva. Let's watch a one minute video that summarizes everything I just said. And you can listen to it here because we'll be off the air. So Brother Mark's going to show the video. It's only one minute long. Welcome to Shiluva. Shiluva is the sanctuary of one of the first apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Europe. It took place in 1608 and it is officially acknowledged by the Catholic Church. Shiluva is located in the northern eastern part of Europe in Lithuania and it was an object of attraction for people from 41 different countries in the year 2018. The most important objects in Shiluva are the Baroque Basilica, where the miraculous picture of the Blessed Virgin Mary with the Divine Child is being held. The picture was solemnly canonized in 1786. The Chapel of Apparition, with the miraculous stone rebuilt in 1924. The Chapel of the Sick. The Way of the Cross around Shilova. The Stops of Rosary in the Main Square and the 20 km section of the road from Rasaini to Shulva has monuments of crosses and chapels created by artists. The 13th day of every month is Mary's Day. The last Friday of every month is the Day of the Sick. Every Friday, the Way of the Cross around Shulva. Every other day, the Chaplet of the Divine Mercy. Saint Pope John Paul II visited Shulva in the year 1993. This tradition of pilgrimage has been vibrant and popular for over 500 years. Are you ready to come? 
Okay, so an incredible story, an incredible place. And so um, if you ever get a chance to get to Europe, this is a must-see just the devotion of the people. In fact, many miracles over the years have been reported from there. So many people come. They had to build larger churches in this area to accommodate all the pilgrims. So devotion to Our Lady of Shiluva is growing, has grown. Um, then, of course, World War II, there was some loss of freedom, but now that's been restored. Even in this Western world of decay of our morals, it, it has been described... Now, this is shocking to me. The church has described, this is coming from high up in the church, Our Lady of Shaluva as probably the most powerful intercessor before God. I had never heard that before. That's incredible. The apparition, you've never heard of. Okay, so let's finish with one everybody has heard of. Let's go to our next slide. This is Rue de Bac, which is the name of the road in Paris, but you may know it more as the Miraculous Medal. The Miraculous Medal. This goes back to 1830. Now, the story here real quick, I only got a few minutes to finish, but on November 28th, and that's the birthday of my lifelong best friend, Nick Rafka, was killed in a auto accident. So this reminds me, you know, God gives you little sparks to always pray for people when you see things like dates of their birthdays or the date they died. Nick Rafko was my ultimate best friend, the brother I never had. His sister was Miss America, um, our babysitter. How many guys can say they were babysat by Miss America? <laughs> and, and, um, he was the linebacker on the University of Wisconsin football team and played in the Rose Bowl and was engaged to his high school sweetheart, had his whole life in front of him and was killed in a car wreck. His birthday is November 28th, so that's why it's near and dear to my heart. But let's look at our next slide. St. Catherine Labore, you've probably heard of her. If you can see it on the screen, don't you love her habit? Look at the wing on her head, this giant habit, right? I don't know how you function getting through doorways with, with such a large head uh, ornament. It's, it's beautiful. Well, anyway, on November 28th, the church honors St. Catherine Labore. She was a daughter of charity. That was her, her a religious order. When Mary appeared... Mary appeared to her requesting that the miraculous medal be made and all who would wear it would receive great graces. Now, this story is amazing. I want to tell you something you probably didn't know, even though everybody has heard of the miraculous medal. So stay with us. Now, St. Catherine Labore was born in France in 1806. Horrible time in France. The French Revolution... Uh, Napoleonic Wars, it just, it was a mess. She was the ninth of 11 children, good Catholic families, right? And upon her mother's death at only eight years old, she took over the responsibilities of the household. Are you kidding me? Now we have people 28 years old that still don't take over responsibilities. God bless her. So eventually she became a daughter of charity, as I said, and when she was just a novice at age 24, the Virgin Mary appeared to her for the first time. Now, this gets amazing. Let's look at our next slide. Later, Mary appeared to her again, requesting that she have a medal made, portraying our mother, Mary. Now, it took two years before Catherine was able to convince her spiritual director to have this medal created, but eventually he listened. They made 2,000 medals. Now, they went so fast, people took them so quickly, that it was called a miracle in itself. Now, after these visions ceased, St. Catherine Elaboré spent the rest of her life in humble service, guess what? As a portress, just like St. Faustina. What's a portress? It's the most humble job in the monastery or the convent. You're not allowed to do anything but open the door. It's really humbling. And that's what Sister Faustina did. All right? She worked with the sick in a convent, then later, in Paris. 
Now, she spent time in silence. She never told her superior that she was the one that Mary appeared to and gave the medal. Now the medal's becoming wide known, and she never in her humility said anything for 45 years. Now, she died in Paris on New Year's Eve, 1876, canonized in the 1900s, 1947, by Pius XII. Now, here's a picture. She's incorrupt. Here's a picture of her incorrupt body that's lying <clears throat> in the crypt of her convent. That's St. Catherine Labore. I've done a whole talk on incorruptibles that you can see online. Now, the specific apparition occurred on November 27th, the day before the t her feast day, 1830. Now listen to this. Like the scapular, y'all have your brown scapulars? Okay, wearing your brown scapulars? Like the brown scapular, the miraculous medal is a sacramental, which means it's a symbol of our faith. Now, what's, here's what's fascinating. This is only one of three sacramentals officially approved by the church liturgically for public prayer. We have all kinds of sacramentals, and they're good. There's only three. You know what they are? The rosary, the brown scapular, and the miraculous medal. That's it. That's incredible. And I'm talking about for public prayer. Well, Father, what about holy water? Of course, holy water, but we're, we're talking about things used in prayer. This is amazing. So let's look at our next slide. Here is a picture of the miraculous metal, the front and the back, okay? Now, St. Catherine saw Mary standing on a half globe. So take a look at the metal. If you're wearing a metal, you can look at it. With a serpent crushed under her feet, and on her hand, she was wearing rings, holding at first a small globe with a cross. Now, she lets that go in a minute, but anyway, a bright light came forth from the jewels on her fingers, all right? And this small globe that she was holding in her hands disappeared, and then she opened her hands. This is what you see in the miraculous medal. So you see Mary like this. Now, this is important. The light from the jewels extended from her hands. Look at the metal. Do you see the rays coming out of her hands? Oh, that's scandalous. You're saying that Mary generates the grace. No, she doesn't. The grace comes from God. But she distributes it. Just like she's the neck, Jesus is the head, Mary's the neck, the grace of God goes through the neck, through Mary to the body, us. So, this is what happens. The light from these jewels extended out of her hands and a semicircle appeared over her with the inscription, you all know this, O oh Mary, conceived without original sin, Pray for us who have recourse to thee. If you do no other prayers your whole day, Father, I have no time to pray. Father, my kids drive me crazy. Father, I'm working two jobs. Father, I get no sleep. I can't. You can find, you can find five seconds. Five seconds throughout the day when you're standing in line at the grocery store, standing in line at the bank, waiting on hold on the telephone, and don't tell me you don't wait on hold on the telephone. <laughs> oh, Mary, conceived without original sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. That is the Immaculate Conception. We are the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. So let's go back to that slide again if Brother Mark can put it back up. The vision then rotated, and on the reverse side of the medal, you saw the letter M. I always laugh because I said the other day that God has a way of giving us great things and then the devil mocks it, right? Yesterday on the first Fridays, I talked about my fraternity. It's a community of men who live together for a common cause, but yet that common cause was anything but valor. It was 
promiscuity and alcoholism. I think that was the devil's way of mocking religious communities. And I said, please, if your fraternity's good and, and you stay on the right path, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not meaning all religious communities. I'm talking about my old one. I also pointed out the beads at Mardi Gras. Yeah, they were created for something fine, but they're used, they're misused now by ladies exposing themselves. I believe those beads mock the rosary. And so I look at my office and I got all these big M's. And I'm like, uh, does that mean Michigan father or does that mean Mary? <laughs> And so we have to realize that there's deeper symbols in these beautiful things. <clears throat> and what we have in the miraculous medal is an M. That stands for Mary. And under the M are two hearts engulfed in flames. One circled in thorns. That's Jesus, sacred heart. And the other pierced by a sword. That's Mary's immaculate heart. Hence, yesterday, the sacred heart of Jesus. Today, the immaculate heart of Mary. Part of the four big devotions. Divine mercy, sacred heart of Jesus, immaculate heart of Mary, first Fridays, first Saturdays, and precious blood, which will come up in July. Now, Mary then told St. Catherine, have a medal struck upon this model. Those who wear it will receive great graces, especially if they wear it around the neck. Those who wear this medal will get great graces, especially those who wear it around the neck. Let's watch a quick one-minute video that's going to show you the whole meaning of the miraculous medal. Let's take a look. Almost 200 years ago, in the very heart of France, a novice of the Daughters of Charity called St. Catherine Labouré had a vision. Virgin Mary herself asked her to struck a very special medal known today as the miraculous medal. And today, we're going to learn the true meaning of the Miraculous Medal and why it is so important to wear it. The story of the Miraculous Medal begins the night of the 27th of November, 1830, when St. Catherine Labouré attended a two-hour apparition of the Holy Virgin, where the drawing of the Miraculous Medal came to light in two phases. In the first phase, the Virgin appears to St. Catherine standing upon a globe and crushing the snake. During the apparition, the Virgin Mary emanates two beams of light. In the second phase, Virgin Mary lowers her hands while a halo around her head creates a sentence. O oh Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recursed to thee. At this point, the image of the Virgin Mary disappears, leaving space to a very bright M with on top a cross and the holy hearts of Jesus and Mary on the bottom while 12 shining stars, which correspond to the 12 apostles of the church, form the holy crown of the Virgin. This part will be the back of the miraculous medal. Also, Our Lady of Grace herself has promised great graces to those who wear it with faith. Okay, so awesome, everybody. If you're here at our shrine and you didn't get a chance to see this on your phone, it will be on our YouTube channel, Divine Mercy, or our Facebook page, Divine Mercy Official. Okay, now, to finish, Mary explained the meaning of this medal. And here it is. She identified herself as queen of heaven and earth. This makes sense. How dare you Catholics call her queen of heaven? Yes, it makes sense. Jesus comes from the line of the King of David, the Davidic kingdom. And in the Davidic kingdom, who was the queen? The queen was not the wife of the king. They had hundreds of wives. The queen was the mother. So if Jesus comes from the line of David and fulfills the Davidic kingdom, it makes sense he's the king. And in this line, who was the queen? The king's mother. So it makes sense Mary is the queen. Now on it, she crushes Satan who is helpless before her. This goes to Genesis 3.15. You will crush his head. Her arms are open and the rays of light are graces that she obtains for those who ask. Notice, those who ask. You wonder why God's not working in your life? Are you properly disposed? Are you in a state of grace? And are you asking? And for when you mess up, are you going to confession to be reconciled. If you're not, 
then you're putting a block up between God trying to give those graces to you. So the dark jewels, okay, there's, hands on, there's jewels on our hands. There's dark ones that were not full of light. These dark ones represent the graces that are available, but people have not received because they didn't ask for them. All this is in this little metal. So there's these dark, it's, it's really interesting, there's these jewels and the dark ones that are not full of light represent all the graces that are available, but nobody has asked for them. Man, start asking. All right, to finish on the back of the medal, we saw 12 stars. In the video, it said that those are the 12 apostles who represent the whole church surrounding Mary, just like the upper room. We are now in between Ascension and Pentecost tomorrow. What happened between the Ascension and Pentecost? The 12 apostles surrounded Mary in the upper room. This medal has Mary the M surrounded by the 12 stars of the apostles. Now there's a horizontal bar. That horizontal bar, Mary said, represents the earth. Now the placement of the cross and the bar and inside the letter M shows that Mary's participation is in the cross and in the world. She does both. This is beautiful. The two hearts are those of Jesus and Mary burning with love for all of us. And with the church approval, the first medals were made in 1832. And reports of miraculous cures began right away. So much that the medal became known as the miraculous medal because so many miraculous healings and cures were reported. Do you know uh, Mother Teresa's community, the missionary charity, they distribute two million medals a year. They hand them everywhere. I remember when I was a novice, my two novice brothers, we were driving up to uh, Stockbridge from Washington, and we went into a convenience store. And I'm up at the front getting my... Uh, my favorite are gummy bears, or uh, the gummy lifesavers. So I'm getting my gummy lifesavers, and I look at my brothers going back to the magazine rack where the pornography was. I'm thinking, huh? And I, I, I was just kind of like watching him, thinking, is he actually going to pick up that magazine and look at it? And all of a sudden, he pulls a miraculous metal out of his pocket and lays it. They had the high shelves, so nobody could see it. He put it down in the shelf where the magazines were. I was like, wow, what a great idea. What a great idea. So the missionaries of charity, they spread these things everywhere. You can put them on seats at airports. You can leave them on the bus. Leave them in the Uber. You can do this. This is how you can evangelize. People see it and they're like, what is this? It's really powerful. It received liturgical approbation, meaning approved for public prayer in 1895. As I said before, it's only one of three sacramentals in the church to be liturgically honored, sharing the distinction, as I said, with the rosary and the brown scapular. Big stuff. It's not a good luck charm. It's not a rabbit's foot. It's not superstition. It can bring conversion. We also have in our EWTN show the story of Zachary King, a former Satanist and high wizard. You know what brought about his conversion? He was a Satanist. He was a high wizard in the church of Satan. And he was working at the mall, dressed up in all his tattoos and piercings. And this woman goes up to him at the mall. He had nothing to do with God. He was actually on the other side. And this woman comes up to him at the mall and says, can I talk to you for a minute? He's like, yes. And she says, would you take a look at this? He didn't know what it was. He put his hand out, and this lady laid a miraculous medal in his hand. He said he felt a voltage go through his whole body. And all of a sudden, it all went black. He lost the complete vision of the mall. Everybody disappeared, and he saw the Blessed Mother. If you haven't seen this story, it's on our YouTube channel as well, under Living Divine Mercy. It was under Halloween of last year. 
And so our Halloween episode of last year has his story. And he converted instantly. Now he goes around the world talking about the miraculous medal and the Blessed Mother. How his whole conversion was brought about by that single medal. Now we're not worshiping the medal. We're not idolaters. This is not it. We're not even worshiping Mary. Mary takes us to Jesus. And that was what her message was to Zachary King. That I want to lead you to my son. What is wrong with that? nothing. It's our salvation. All right, so <clears throat> let's go to our next slide. One of the most famous conversions was Alphonse Radis Bone. He was a Jewish atheist. Here's his picture in 1842. He despised the church when his brother became a priest. And then on a dare from a Catholic friend, a baron of all people, he began to wear the miraculous medal and to recite the memorari just to prove that it was useless. He did that just to prove it was useless. One night, he was with his friend Baron in Rome. The Baron, that was a title because it was Baron de Boussier. And they, he went, this Baron went into the church. So, Radis Bone, he followed him. Just, eh. And they separated, and a few minutes later, the baron found him weeping and kissing the medal that he was wearing in mockery. And all he could yell was, I saw her, I saw her. So he documented, this was documented, what he saw. He wrote it down. I saw someone standing on the altar, a lofty, shining figure, all majesty and sweetness, the virgin, just as she looks on this medal. Some irresistible force drew me towards her. She motioned to me to kneel down, and when I did so, she seemed to approve in honor of her son. Though she never said a word, I understood her perfectly. Wow. He immediately converted to Catholicism, and guess what? He was ordained a Catholic priest in 1847. Amazing. And he then did better. He moved to the Holy Land and founded a congregation of sisters, the congregation of Our Lady of Sion. And guess what their role is? To pray for the conversion of the Jews. He was a Jewish atheist. So anyway, an image of Mary as she appeared to him was painted a few months after the apparition and was hung above the altar in that church where he was. Now, here's what's fascinating. Maximilian Kolbe celebrated his first mass in that same church in front of that same image. Because when he was a seminarian, he heard this story. He heard a talk about this guy. And later, Kolbe began the Militia Immaculata. And guess what? These are the men that consecrate themselves totally and unconditionally to Mary. And take a look at your next slide. Here's a picture of him. All members of the Militia Immaculata wear the miraculous medal as a sign of their total consecration to Mary, and they distribute it so that Mary may work wonders of grace. Are you kidding me? This is incredible. And of the miraculous medal, Maximilian Kolbe said, quote, even though a person be the worst of the worst sort, and we all know them, if not ourselves, <laughs> if only he agrees to wear this medal, give it to him, and then pray for him. And at the proper moment, strive to bring him closer to his immaculate mother, so that he has a recourse to her in all difficulties and in temptations. Wow. So wearing this disposes us to receive God's grace through Mary. Amen? Amen. Wow. That is incredible, and we never hear about these gifts of our faith. In fact, I am going on a pilgrimage. I'm only doing two pilgrimages this year. One is to France later this month. 
through select tours. I, I don't know if it's closed or if it's finished, but you could, if you want to join us, you could call them. Select tours, or you can call Peter, my assistant. He can check for you. Uh, let's put up on the slide. Um, you know what? First, I sorry, best of brother Mark. First, the slide is please be a Marian helper. You know, um, micprayers.org. If you'd like to join our Marian family, there's no cost. It takes 10 seconds. Join micprayers.org and be part of our Marian family and receive many graces like we've been talking about. But the next slide I wanted to show you, this one is the pilgrimage to France. And again, I don't know the details of it, but if you'd like to join us, it's from June, 30, uh, June 20th to July 2nd. And you can call my assistant, Peter. He's at 413-298-1303 if you want to join us. Now, we're going to be visiting the Shrine of the Miraculous Medal, amongst other things, Therese and Lisieux, Lourdes, and other things. Now, if you can't make it, because it's too late, please join us for my only other pilgrimage, the Shrines of Wisconsin. Here, you don't have to leave the United States. And by the way, France is not requiring the vaccine, by the way. So the Shrines of Wisconsin, Steve Ray does a great job. You can join us with Steve Ray. All the details are up there. Again, if you'd like to join me, I'll be speaking at the Love Being Catholic Conference. That's up in Wisconsin to visit those shrines. Again, you can visit uh, or email Peter at peterjames at miriam.org or call him 413-298-1303. Guys, there is nothing more important than our faith. And God is giving us so many ways to live it. We just finished learning about it. Now we're going to live it. So for a few minutes, Brother Mark is going to shut down this current live stream. Please don't go away because in a few minutes, we'll come back up and we'll do the devotion of the first Saturdays. If you're here with us in person, please stay with us. Only about five minutes. We'll then begin what Our Lady asks us to do on first Saturday, which if you don't know, is today. God bless you.